Hello, I am Victor Ethelstan, and welcome to the fourth episode of the Medieval Monk Podcast. Before we begin, I will note that it is raining while I record this episode. Uh, I apologize if you hear any noise in the background. It's November, which means it's NaNoWriMo, or National Novel Writing Month. For this NaNoWriMo, I am writing book three in my series, Tales from the Monastery. This series is about a boy growing up in an early 10th century monastery. I am currently querying book one. Fingers crossed that I'll be able to find an agent soon. Because I am busy writing and querying, today's podcast will technically be story-driven. I say technically because instead of a story, I will be reading from The Rule of St. Benedict. The Rule of St. Benedict uh, is not full of stories like the Dialogue on Miracles, but it is a guideline for monastic life. It was one of the most popular monastic rules in the Middle Ages. The text contains a preface and 73 short chapters. Each chapter focuses on a specific aspect of monastic life. The Rule of St. Benedict has been translated many times since it was first written in the early 6th century. I currently own D. Oswald Hunter Blair's 1906 edition. His edition is in the public domain and can be found online. Today, I will read the preface and chapters 1 through 5 of The Rule of St. Benedict. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this primary medieval text. Uh, As a note before we begin, I mistakenly called it the preface when in actuality it is the prologue. So I will begin with the prologue. Prologue of our Most Holy Father, St. Benedict, to his rule. Hearken, O my son, to the precepts of thy master, and incline the ear of thine heart. Willingly receive and faithfully fulfill the admonition of thy loving father that thou mayest return by the labor of obedience to him from whom thou hadst departed through the sloth of disobedience. To thee, therefore, my words are now addressed, whoever thou art that, renouncing thy own will, dost take up the strong and bright weapons of obedience in order to fight for the Lord Christ, our true King. In the first place, whatever good work thou beginnest to do, beg of him with the most earnest prayer to perfect that he who hath now granted to count us in the number of his children may not at any time be grieved by our evil deeds. For we must always serve so serve him with the good things he hath given us, that not only may he never, as an angry father, disinherit his children, but may never, as a dreadful lord, incensed by our sins, deliver us to everlasting punishment." as most wicked servants who would not follow him to glory. Let us then at length rise, since the scripture stirreth us up, saying, It is time now for us to rise from sleep, and our eyes being open to the defying light, let us hear with wondering ears what the divine voice admonished us thus, daily crying out, Today, if ye shall hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And again, he that hath ears, to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And what saith he? Come, my children, hearken to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Run while ye have the light of life, lest the darkness of death seize hold of you. And the Lord, seeking his own workmen in the multitude of of the people to whom he thus crieth out, saith again, who is the man that will have life and desireth to see good days? And thou, hearing him answer, I am he. God saith to thee, If thou wilt have true and everlasting life, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from that they speak no guile. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And when you have done these things, my eyes will be upon you and my ears will be open to your prayers. And before you call upon me, I will say unto you, Behold, I am here. What can be sweeter to us, dearest dearest brethren, than this Lord of the Lone inviting us? Behold, in his loving kindness, the Lord shows us, shows to us the way of life. Having our loins, therefore, girded with faith and the performance of good works, let us walk in his paths by the guidance of the gospel. 
that we may deserve to see him who hath called us to his kingdom. And if we wish to dwell in the tabernacle of his kingdom, we shall by no means reach it unless we run thither by our good deeds. But let us ask the Lord with the prophet, saying to him, Lord, who shall dwell in thy tabernacle, or who shall rest upon thy holy hill? After this question, brethren, let us hear the Lord answering, and showing to us the way to his tabernacle, and saying, He that walketh without stain, and worketh justice, he that shall speaketh truth in his heart, that hath not done guile with his tongue, he that shall done, done no evil to his neighbor, and hath not taken up a reproach against his neighbor. He that hath brought the malignant evil to one not, casting him out of his heart with all his suggestions, and hath taketh his bad thoughts while they were yet young, and dashed them down upon the rock Christ. These are they who, fearing the Lord, are not puffed up with their own good works, but knowing that the good which is in them cometh not from themselves, but from the Lord. Magnify the Lord who worketh in them, saying with the prophet, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give thy glory, give the glory. So the Apostle Paul imputed nothing of his preaching to himself, but said, By the grace of God, I am what I am. And again he saith, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Hence also the Lord saith in the gospel, he that heareth these words of mine and doeth them is like a wise man who built his house upon a rock. The floods came, the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, because it was founded upon a rock. And the Lord, in fulfillment of his words, is waiting daily for us to respond by our deeds to his holy admonitions. Therefore, we, therefore are the days of our life lengthened, for the amendment of our evil ways, as saith the apostle, Knoweth thou not what the patience of God is leading thee to repentance? For the merciful Lord saith, I will not the death of a sinner, but that he should be converted and live. Since then, brethren, we have asked of the Lord who is to inhabit his temple, we have heard his commands to those who are to dwell there. And if we fulfill those duties, we shall be heirs of the kingdom of heaven. Our hearts, therefore, and our bodies must be made ready to fight under the holy obedience of his commands. Let us ask God to supply by the help of his grace what by nature is not possible to us. And if we would arrive at eternal life, escaping the pains of hell, then while there is yet time, while we are still in the flesh and are able to fulfill all these things by the light which is given us, we must hasten to do now what will profit us for all eternity. We have, therefore, to establish a school of the Lord's service in the setting forth of which we hope to order nothing that is harsh or rigorous. But if anything be somewhat strictly laid down according to the dictates of sound reason for the amendment of vices in the preservation of charity, do not therefore fly in dismay from the way of salvation, whose beginning cannot but be straight and difficult. But as we go forward in our life and in our faith, we shall with hearts enlarged and unspeakable sweetness of love run in the way of God's commandments, so that never departing from his guidance, but persevering in his teaching in the monastery until death, we may by patience share in the sufferings of Christ, that we may deserve to be partakers of his kingdom. Amen. That was the prologue. And now we shall go on to chapter one. Chapter one of the several kinds of monks and their way of life. It is well known that there are four kinds of monks. The first are the Cenobites. That is those in monasteries who live under the rule of an, under a rule or an abbot. The second are the anchorites or hermits. That is those who, not in the first fever of religious life, but long after probation in the monastery, have learned by the help and experience of many to fight against the devil, and going forth well armed from the ranks of their brethren to the single-handed combat of the desert, are able, without the support of others, to fight by the strength of their own arm, God helping them against the vices of 
the flesh and their evil thoughts. The third, a third and most baneful kind of monks are the Cerebites, who have been tried by no rule, nor by the experience of a master, as gold in the furnace, but being as soft as lead, and still serving the word the world in their works, are known by their tonsure to lie to God. These in two or threes, or even singly, without a shepherd, shut up, not in the Lord's sheepfolds, but in their own, make a law to themselves in the pleasure of their own desires. Whatever they think fit or choose to do, that they call holy, and what they like not, that they consider unlawful. The fourth kind of monks are those called Jirovagi, who spend all their lives long wandering about divers' providences, staying in different cells for two or three days at a time, for three or four days at a time, ever roaming with no stability, given up on their own pleasures into the snares of gluttony, or worse, in all things than the Cerebites. Of the most wretched life of these, it is better to say nothing than to speak. Leaving them alone, therefore, let us set to work by the help of God to lay down a rule for the Cenobites, that is, the strongest kind of monks. End of chapter one. Uh, chapter two, what kind of man the abbot ought to be? An abbot who is worthy to rule over the monastery ought always to remember what he is called and correspond to his name of superior by his deeds. For he is believed to hold the place of Christ in the monastery. Since he is called by his name, as the apostle saith, ye have received the spirit of the adoption of children in which we cry, Abba, Father. And therefore the abbot ought not, God forbid, to teach or ordain or command anything contrary to the law of the Lord, but let his bidding and his doctrine be infused into the minds of his disciples like the leaven of design of divine justice. Let the abbot be ever mindful that at the dreadful judgment of God an account will have to be given both of his own teaching and of the obedience of his disciples. And let him know that to the fault of the shepherd shall be imputed any lack of profit, which the father of the household may find in his sheep. Only then shall he be acquitted, and if he shall have bestowed any pastoral vigilance on his unquiet and disobedient flock, and employed all his care to amend their corrupt nature of life, then shall he be absolved in the judgment of the Lord. And may say to the Lord, the, with the prophet, I have not hidden thy justice in my heart. I have declared thy truth and thy salvation, but they contempted and despised me. And then at the length, the punishment of death shall be inflicted on the disobedient sheep. Therefore, when any one receiveth the name of abbot, he ought to govern his disciples by twofold teaching. That is, he should show forth all goodness and holiness by his deeds rather than his words declaring to the intelligent among his disciples the commandments of the Lord by words, but to the hard-hearted and the simple-minded, setting forth the, the divine precepts by the example of his deeds, and let him show by his own actions that those things ought not to be done with which he has taught his disciples to be against the law of God, lest while preaching to others he should himself become a castaway. And God should say to him in his sin, Why dost thou declare my justice and take my co covenant in thy mouth? Thou, thus, thou hast hated discipline and hast cast my words behind thee. And again, thou who sawest the mote in thy brother's eye, didst thou not see the beam in thine own? Let him make no distinction of persons in the monastery. Let not one be loved more than another, unless he be found to excel in good works and or in obedience. Let not one of noble birth be put for, before him that was formerly a slave, unless some other reasonable cause exists for it. But upon just consideration, it should so seem to the abbot, let him arrange as he please concerning the place of any one whomever, whomsoever, but otherwise let them keep their own places, because whether bond or free, we are all one in Christ and bear an equal rank in the service of one Lord. For with God, there is no respecting of per persons, only 
For one reason are we preferred in his sight, if we be found to surpass others in good works and in humility. Let the abbot then show equal love to all, and let the same discipline be imposed upon all according to their deserts. For the abbot in his doctrine ought always to observe the bidding of the apostle, wherein he says, reprove, re entreat, rebuke, mingling as occasions may require gentleness with severity, showing now the rigor of a master, now the loving affection of a father, and so, so as sternly to rebuke the undisciplined and restless, and to extort the obedient, mild, and patient to advance in virtue. And such as are negligent and haughty, we charge him to reprove and correct. Let him not shut his eyes to the faults of offenders, but as soon as they appear, let him strive with all his might to root them out, remembering the fate of Healy, the priest of Silo. Of those of good disposition and understanding, let him, for the first or second time, correct only with words, but such are as are frowned for frownward and hard of heart and proud or disobedient, let him chaste with bodily stripes at the very first offense, knowing that it is written, the fool is not corrected with words. And again, strike thy son with the rod, and thou shalt deliver his soul from death. The abbot ought always to remember what he is and what he is called, and to know that to whom more is committed, from him more is required. And he must consider how difficult and arduous a task he hath undertaken of ruling souls and adapting himself to many dispositions. Let him so accommodate and suit himself to the character and intelligence of each, winning some by kindness, others by reproof, others by persuasion, that he may not only suffer no loss in the flock committed to him, but may even rejoice in their virtuous increase. Above all, let him not, overlooking or undervaluing the salvation of the souls entrusted to him, be too solicitous for fleeting, earthly, and perishable things. But let him ever bear in mind that he hath undertaken the government of souls, of which he shall have to give an account, and that he may not complain of, for want of worldly substance, let him remember what it is written. Seek first the kingdom of God and his justice, and all these things shall be added unto you. And again, nothing is wanting to them that fear him. And let him know that he who hath undertaken the government of souls must prepare himself to render an account of them. And whatever may be the number of brethren under his care, let him certainly, let him be certain, certainly assured that on the day of judgment, he will have to give an account to the Lord of all these souls, as well as of his own. And thus, being ever fearful of the coming inquiry which the shepherd will make unto the state of the flock committed to him, while he is careful on other men's account, he will be solicitous also on his own. And so, while correcting others by his admonitions, he will be himself cured of his own defects. End of chapter 2. And now we are going to chapter three, uh, chapter three of calling the brethren to counsel. As often as any important matters have to be transacted in the monastery, let the abbot call together the whole community and himself declare what is the question to be settled. And having heard the counsel of the brethren, let him consider within himself and then do what he shall judge most expedient. We have said that all should be called to counsel, because it is often to the younger that the Lord revealeth what is best. But let the brethren give their advice with all subjection and humility, and not pressure stubbornly to defend their own opinion, but rather let the matter rest with the abbot's discretion, that all may submit to whatever he shall judge to be best. Yet, even as it becometh disciples, to obey their master, so doth it behoove him to order all things prudently and with justice. Let all, therefore, follow the rule in all things as their guide, and let no man rashly turn aside from it. Let no one in the monastery follow the will of his own heart, nor let anyone presume insolently to contend with his abbot, either within or without the monastery. 
but if he should so presume, let him be subjected to the discipline appointed by the rule. The abbot himself, however, must do everything with the fear of God, and in observance of the rule, knowing that he will have without doubt to render to God the most just judge an account of all his judgments. If it happens that less important matters have to be transacted for the good of the community, for the good of the monastery, let him take counsel with the seniors only, as it is written, do all things with counsel, and thou shalt not afterwards repent it. And that is the end of chapter three. Next, we go to chapter four. Uh, this is actually a list, um, list of 72 items on how to be a good monk. Chapter four, what are the instruments of good works? In the first place, to love the Lord God with all one's heart and all one's souls and all one's strength. Two, then one's neighbor as oneself. Three, then not to kill. Four, not to commit adultery. Five, not to steal. Six, not to covet. Seven, not to bear false witnesses. Eight, to honor all men. Nine, not to do to one another what one would not have done to oneself. Ten, to deny oneself in order to follow Christ. Eleven, to chastise the body. Twelve, not to seek after delicate living. Thirteen, to love fasting, 14, to relieve the poor, 15, to clothe the naked, 16, to visit the sick, 17, to bury the dead, 18, to help in affliction, 19, to console the sorrowing, 20, to keep aloof from worldly actions, 21, to, per to prefer nothing to the love of Christ, 22, not to give way to anger, 23, not to harbor a desire of revenge, 24, not to foster guile in one's heart. 25, not to make a feigned peace. 26, not to forsake charity. 27, not to swear, lest perchance one forswear oneself. 28, to utter truth from heart and mouth. 29, not to render evil for evil. 30, to do no wrong to anyone, yea, to bear patiently wrong done to oneself. 31, to love one's enemies. 32, not to render cursing for cursing, but rather blessing. 33, to bear persecution for justice sake. 34, not to be proud. 35, not given to wine. 36, not a glutton. 37, not drowsy. 38, not, not slothful. 39, not a murmurer. 40, not a, not a detractor. 41, to put one's hope in God. 42, to attribute any good that one sees in oneself to God and not to oneself. 43, but to recognize and always impute to oneself the evil that one doth. 44, to fear the day of judgment. 45, to be in dread of hell. 46, to desire with all spiritual longing everlasting life. 47, to keep death daily before one's eyes. 48, to keep guard at all times over the actions of one's life. 49, to know for certain that God sees one everywhere. 50, to dash down on the rock, Christ, one's evil thoughts, the instant that they come into the heart. 51, and to lay them open to one's spiritual father. 52, to keep one's mouth from speaking evil and wicked words. 53, not to love much speaking. 54, not to speak vain words or such as move to laughter. 55, not to love much or excessive laughter. 56, to listen willingly to holy reading. 57, to apply oneself frequently to prayer. 58, daily to confess one's past sins with tears and sighs to God and to amend them for time to come. 59. Not to fulfill the desires of the flesh, to hate one's own will. 60. To obey in all things the commands of the abbot, even though he himself, which God forbid, should act otherwise, being mindful of the precept of the Lord, what they say, do ye, but what they do, do ye not. 61. 
not to wish to be called holy before one is so, but first to be holy, that one may truly be so called. 62. Daily to fulfill one's deeds, the commandments of God. 63. To love chastity. 64. To hate no man. 65. Not to give way to jealousy and envy. 66. Not to love strife. 67. To fly from vainglory. 68. To reverence the seniors. 69. To love the juniors. 70. To pray for one's enemy in the love of Christ. 71. To make peace with an adversary before setting of the setting of the sun. 72. And never to despair the mercy of God. Behold, these are the tools of the spiritual craft, which, if they be constantly employed day and night and duly given back on the day of judgment, will gain for us from the Lord that reward which he himself hath promised, which I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor hath it entered into the heart of man to conceive what God hath prepared for them that love him. And the workshop where we are to labor in all these things in the cloister of the monastery and the stability of the community. That is end of chapter four. And now we are beginning chapter five. Chapter five of obedience. The first degree of humility is obedience without delay. This becometh those who hold nothing dearer to them than Christ and those who on account of the holy servitude which they have taken upon them either for fear of hell or for the glory of life everlasting, as soon as anything is ordered by the superior, suffer no more delay in doing it than if it had been commanded by God himself. It is of these that the Lord saith, at the hearing of the ear that he hath come in, obeyed me. And again to the teachers he saith, he that heareth you heareth me. Such as these, therefore, leaving immediately their own occupations and forsaking their own will, with their hands disengaged and leaving unfinished what they were about, with the speedy step of obedience, follow by their deeds the voice of him who commands. And so, as it were, at the same instant, the bidding of the master and the perfect fulfillment of the disciple are joined together in the swiftness of the fear of God. God by those who are moved with the desire of attaining eternal life. These, therefore, choose the narrow way of which the Lord saith, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, so that living not by their own will, nor obeying their own desires and pleasures, but walking according to the judgment and command of another, and dwelling in the community, they desire to have an abbot over them. Such as these, without doubt, fulfill that saying of the Lord. I came not to do my own will, but the will of he, him who sent me. But this very obedience will then only be acceptable to God and sweet to men, if what is commanded be done, not fearfully, tardily, nor coldly, nor with murmuring, nor with an answer showing unwillingness. For the obedience which is given to superiors is given to God, since he himself hath said, He that heareth you heareth me. And it ought to be given by disciples with a good will, because God loveth a cheerful giver. For if the disciple obeyeth with ill will and murmur, not only with his lips, but even in his heart, although he fulfill the commandment, yet it will not be accepted by God, who regardeth the heart of the murmurer. And for such an action he shall gain no reward, nay, rather, he shall incur the punishment due to the murmurers, unless he amend and make satisfaction. And that is the end of chapter 5. Uh, the rule of St. Benedict is pretty hard to read, so uh, I apologize for any stumbling or um, mispronunciations or um, just going back and uh, repeating myself. Um, I'm not really used to reading such complicated language out loud. Uh, so thank you for being patient with me. Um, and I might read more sections of the Rule of St. Benedict in another episode. Um, I haven't really decided yet. We'll see. Um, I have provided a link to one version of D. Oswald Hunter Blair's translation in the caption for this episode. Um, Thank you so much for listening and stay safe out there. 
Also, I hope uh, everyone, all the writers out there, have a good NaNoWriMo and uh, work hard and good luck.